Please welcome my guest today, Jim Lovell, commander of Apollo 13. I was preparing for this interview and I realized something. I've done a considerable number of interviews in my day, some perhaps 500 or more. And if I say an average of 20 to 30 questions, that's 10 to 15,000 questions I've asked. But this interview really boils down to one question. And as a professional interviewer, I have to ask you, here you were, Apollo 13 mission, 200,000 miles away from the Earth. Your oxygen tanks have blown. You may be five hours in the main module, 45 hours max in the lunar module, and you're 100 hours away from the Earth. Now, here's my professional question. What were you going to do? Well, I could have bounced off the walls for about 10 minutes, but we'd be right back where we started from. So uh, we had to start thinking. That's right. Now, te now, tell us the scenario. So everyone's all on the same page here, the scenario of the Apollo 13 mission. Well, the scenario of the Apollo 13 mission started out to go to a place called Frau Mara, which is in the hills of the uh, of the moon. Uh, the first two uh, craft landed in the Mari or the seas, uh, and that's the flat areas. If you look at the Mari, it's dark, but the geologists saw that the hills were light, and we could see that with our own eyes just looking at the moon. So they said, go to the hills and pick up the light material. That's what started the whole mission. Uh, the actual mission took off on... Uh, April 11th, 1970, at 13.13 Central Standard Time. Right there, I should have known something was going to happen. That's right. We took off two days out. Of course, uh, we had mated the lunar module and the command module together. I had a television camera in my hand, and I was going into the lunar module with uh, Fred Hayes. I was photographing Fred. Uh, uh, as he looked at the lunar module and tried to determine if everything was in there, the food and the flight plans, uh, we had uh, were beaming the the uh, program back to the Earth. But this was the third lunar landing mission. None of the networks carried it. Even the controllers in mission control were waiting for us to stop the program because they wanted to get back to the ball game that was going on in Houston that night. And then, of course, we heard the bang. Uh, the spacecraft rocked back and forth. We didn't know what happened. Uh, we saw lights come on, warning lights come on, we lost our electrical power in one of our buses, lost two out of three of our fuel cells. They are devices that make electrical power out of oxygen and hydrogen. Uh, and then I saw a gas escaping from the rear end of my spacecraft and noticed that the quantity gauges on my two oxygen tanks, one read zero, and the other one I could actually see the needle go down uh, something you would never see in the normal usage of oxygen. And that's when the old lead weight went down to the bottom of my stomach, and I thought that we were really in deep trouble. Now, that was two days out, and uh, there were three of you. You've got the main uh, capsule that you're in, as well as the lunar. How much room was there? I mean, I know how far you are from me. I mean, how, how big are we talking about? Well, the command module, uh, according to spacecraft in those days, was, was fairly spacious. I mean, we had three people, and it was about a little bit wider than, than you and I right here. Uh, but uh, the lunar module was a lot smaller. We were, of course, mated together. Uh, the command module was dying. It had less than two hours left to, to live. Uh, so we went into the lunar module to use it as a lifeboat. But unfortunately, the, the lunar module was designed to last only 45 hours in order to support two people. We had three people, and we were at least 90 to 95 hours away from you know, getting home again we had, because we had to go around the moon to do it. Right. Now, you were, you were almost to the moon at this point. You're, you're, you're coming in, um, and you were, as I recall how these work, is you would go in, and then you would orbit the moon and then land. And because of this particular mission where you weren't going to the flatlands, you were going to the hills, it was even, it was even worse. Now, tell us about that. Well, of course, we had to uh, uh, to land at a place called Frau Mara. We had to get off the course that we, we, we called a, a free return course, which meant that if our maneuvering engine didn't work, uh, we could the moon would take us around, pull us around, aim us back towards the Earth, and just with our little attitude control rockets, we could make a successful landing. But to get to land at Frau Mara at the proper sunlighting conditions so we could see the rocks, 
we had to get off that free return course. We did that before the accident, by the way. Uh, but now, if something should happen to the spacecraft, the moon would pull us around, aim us back towards the Earth, but the closest point of approach would be about 40,000 miles out, which unfortunately is a little bit too far out to be captured by the Earth's atmosphere for a safe landing. Right. Okay, so um, now take us through it. You, you, The oxygen tank blew. Uh, you were seeing your power go down. How many hours between that time and the time that you got to reentry? Well, uh, the explosion occurred approximately 56 hours, and we finally landed back in the Pacific Ocean at about 142 hours after we had taken out, taken off. So it was another hundred hours of of not knowing. Well, then of course, yeah, but there was we knew a lot was happening. Uh, there was crises going on all the time, and we had to overcome each crisis as we came up to it. One of them was the fact that obviously we didn't have enough electrical power to get home, uh, and so we had to shut everything down. And consequently, we were really flying by the seat of our pants. And uh, without all those exotic electronic devices that you wouldn't be caught out there without, you know, the, the computer or the guidance system or the digital autopilot, all those things uh, were shut off to save power. And all we really had in the way of devices was the radio to talk to the Earth and a little fan that circulated the atmosphere of the spacecraft. You always kept contact with the Earth. You didn't lose that communication, did you? No, we were very fortunate to always be, always talk to the Earth. We did have a lot of static problems, uh, uh, and we lost our what we called our high-gain antennas, so we had to use smaller antennas, and the uh, the communication was very weakened sometimes. Now, normally, you would have taken the lunar module and it would have ascended to, descended rather, to the moon surface and then ascended back up. And then on the way back, you would have jettisoned the, the lunar module, right? Yes, yeah, so the normal mission, when we got to the moon, we would have slowed down to be captured by the moon's gravity, be a satellite of the moon. Then the lunar module would detach. Two of us would get in the lunar module, go down and land, go out and explore, get back in the lunar module, the ascent stage, it's a two-stage vehicle, would take off, rendezvous with the orbiting command module, then we would jettison the ascent stage, and we had a program to go back and impact the moon again to pick up the force of the impact from a seismometer. Uh, and then we would uh, fire the engine of our command module and go home. That was the normal mission. As you went through this, uh, it seems like everyone was working down in mission control. Everybody was working, obviously, up, up in the spacecraft. How did you work that out? I mean, there you, we, now we don't think anything of sending faxes. We don't. You, you had one thing that I thought was pretty ingenious is that at one point, uh, carbon dioxide was building up in the cabin, and uh, the smiley box came about. Now, tell us the story of that. No, no faxes now. All communication. Well, that was another crisis that we had to face. Uh, we had uh, uh, canisters called lithium hydroxide canisters that would remove the carbon dioxide from the atmosphere because as you exhale, you breathe out carbon dioxide. And so the pressure of carbon dioxide, the amount of it was rising all the time. Now, in the lunar module, we had round canisters that fit into a round hole in the environmental system. Unfortunately, there weren't enough of them. To, to support three people for four days. We were running out of them. Now, in the dead command module, we had canisters that would be more than sufficient to support us, but they were square canisters, and you can't put a square canister in a round hole, which was unfortunate, <laughs> an engineering goof that no one ever thought about. And consequently, we had to take a square canister and use tape, plastic, and cardboard to jury-rig it to fit the lunar module system, which was, this whole thing was devised by the Cruise Systems Division down at the Control Center in Houston in working together, a, a perfect example of teamwork and initiative and motivation working to get us back home safely. But also, it was a case of where on a $20 billion program, if you don't take tape, plastic, and cardboard along, you're lost. <laughs> Remember that. <laughs> the... Um, uh, I have to say, I, I've worked for I worked for NASA for a number of years, and we always had backup systems and backup plans and all that type of thing. One thing is that most of the abort protocols for the Apollo mission always presumed that the main engine and the main command module would be available, and you had to utilize the ascent descent engines in the lunar module to do all this maneuvering. 
actually we had to use only the descent engine uh, because uh, if we'd ever used the ascent engine, we w wouldn't have enough fuel to get home. You're right. The uh, uh, the maneuvering engine of the command module was dead, and we had I don't know what was it forty thousand pounds of dead mass on on the end of the lunar module. The lunar module was never designed to fly with a dead command and service module on it. The command and service module was designed to fly with the lunar module attached, but not vice versa. I literally had to learn to fly all over again because the lunar module systems were designed that the center of gravity would be somewhat in the middle of the lunar module, except that the center of gravity moved way out to that command service module. And so when I used the handle to pitch down, the vehicle to pitch down, it went off in some wild gyration because the, you know, the controls were all different. And uh, it took me, oh, several hours to find out how to control the vehicle uh, to make sure uh, to make it go where I wanted it to go. You were literally piloting a brand new craft that had never been really designed for that. That's right. Yes, yeah, so I was piloting a brand new craft. Now, I think it's important for people to know what would have happened had you missed reentry to the Earth's atmosphere. Well, there's two things that could have happened if we missed the reentry. Uh, to come into the Earth's atmosphere, you have to come into a very narrow pie-shaped wedge with respect to the atmosphere itself. It cannot be any less than five and a half degrees or greater than seven and a half degrees. In other words, a two degree pie shaped wedge. And on the way home, you have to thread your way through. If you came in too shallow, you'd skip out like skipping a stone on water. If you came in too steep, the sudden deceleration would make you a fiery meteor over the sky for a few brief seconds. Now, did you know when you were coming in that you were hitting it right? Well, after we did a maneuver to try to get back into that free return course again, we thought we had it made. But uh, after we passed the moon and we're on our way home and everything was powered down and we're trying to save electricity and the ground was tracking us on their large 110-foot dish antenna, they suddenly realized that we are no longer on the proper course to thread our way through the corridor. As a matter of fact, we were coming in too shallow but we would have really missed the atmosphere by about 46 nautical miles. We were, again, in <laughs> trouble. So if you had missed it, what would have happened? We would have probably whistled by the Earth and kept on going into, uh, if we were past uh, escape velocity, we would have gone into orbit about the sun. And you would have just gone into orbit out there. Yeah, just kept on going. We would call back as long as we had oxygen and power and everything else left to go, but we'd have been gone. Did you really contemplate that, or did you just keep working on everything you could do to get back? We kept going as much as possible. It is similar to playing solitaire. You pull up a card. If there's someplace you can put that card, you keep on playing the game. It's only when you pull up the card that there's no place to put it that the game is over. And we never got to that stage. Yeah. Incredible. Well, we're going to spend some time on what went wrong, and that's both a technology story and a human story. Let's spend some time on that. Uh, once everything was over with, there's a pretty interesting story as to why what happened happened. Let's talk about that. Well, the accident is a classic aircraft accident, which if you, and I was an old accident investigator for airplanes, uh, if you look back at it, it was caused by a series of events that overcame either the pilot and or the spacecraft or the airplane in the case of an airplane. The accident was set up five years before we took off. Incredible. At that time, NASA told all of the contractors to make the spacecraft compatible with, I think it was 65-volt DC power available at Cape Kennedy, even though the spacecraft batteries on fuel cells produced 28-volt power, and that's what we flew with. But the higher voltage at the Cape would allow certain tests to be done a lot quicker. So they said, just make all the systems compatible to handle the higher voltage. Everybody did, except the company or the fellow that built the heating system in the oxygen tank. That little heater, which was a combination heater and a fan to stir up the liquid oxygen, and a heater was used in case the pressure dropped a little bit, you could turn on the heater system, the liquid would boil off, build the pressure to keep feeding the fuel cells and the keep the spacecraft pressurized and, and you know, oxygen and breathe. Uh, the thermostat in that heater system was compatible with only 28-volt power. 
That was the original design of the thermostat. They never replaced it with one that would be compatible with 65 volt power. That was the first incident that occurred. Now that discrepancy was on all the flights from Apollo 8 all the way through Apollo 13. But several other things happened in the design of 13 and the construction that led to the accident. One was the fact that when the oxygen tanks were being put into the service module of Apollo 10, not 13, uh, they dropped the tank. Not far, just a couple inches, they dropped the tank. And consequently, they took it out, checked it all over again, but never checked to see after they put liquid oxygen in the tank that they could detank it, which is a way you, you do uh, in just in testing to, to push gaseous oxygen in and force the liquid out. Uh, but everything else worked perfectly. Now, that tank was then recycled, not to Apollo 10, but to Apollo 13. Several weeks before the launch, we did what was known as a countdown demonstration test. We got on the spacecraft, the crew got there, all the other people got up there, the, the controllers. We counted the spacecraft that rocket down to zero, but we did not launch. Just to make sure that everything was all set to go, everybody knew what they were supposed to do, all the consumables, except the, the fuel in the, uh, the rocket itself wasn't put in, but the oxygen in these tanks was put in. After the test was completed and everything did work perfectly for the flight, the ground crew went in to remove the oxygen from the two oxygen tanks. They hooked up a gaseous oxygen hose to the fill line, forced gas through. That gas was supposed to push the liquid out the vent line. But when that started, the gas going in went out and the liquid stayed right where it's supposed to. Well, the ground crew couldn't figure out what was wrong. So they then went back and looked at the schematics of the tank and looked at its history. They found out that it was dropped at the factory. They found out that there was a tube that was in there that was used specifically only to detank the tank, you know, in testing. Never, to, It wouldn't be ever used in, in flight. And they saw that if it was dropped and this tube was loosened, it would give, give the symptoms that they now saw. So they philosophized for a little bit. We could remove the tank, but that would slip the flight for about a month because we'd have to retest and there was only certain times you could take off to go to Frau Mauro. Someone got the idea, well, why don't we turn on the heater system? It's in the tank. We'll boil the oxygen out. After all, the tank worked perfectly for everything in flight. The only thing we couldn't do was remove the oxygen after a test, which we never have to do in flight anyway. Everybody agreed that said that's not a bad idea. Let's just turn on the heater system and, and, and uh, boil out the oxygen. They did turn on the heater system. There were two ways of testing how hot this heater would get. On the, on the control stand or the test stand, there was a gauge, a temperature gauge. Now, the little thermostat was supposed to operate at about 80 degrees. If it got up to 80 degrees, the little contacts of the thermostat would open up, shut it off the power so it wouldn't get too hot. The temperature gauge to check how hot the, this uh, heater system got was calibrated only up to 80 degrees. Another thing we had, we had telemetry, a little readout, a little line that would go along, and when the power dropped off, it would go to zero, and then when the thermostat closed again, to turn the power back on and go on to one. It ran continuously for eight hours. No one ever checked that. What happened? Heater system was turned on. Temperature started to build up. Oxygen started to boil off. Everything was working perfectly. The guy on the uh, test stand watched the thermostat, uh, the temperature gauge go up, got up to about 80 degrees. He thought everything was fine. When the little thermostat started to open up to shut off the power, the high voltage welded the two contacts shut. When that happened, there was no safety measure. The temperature kept rising, but the temperature gauge on the test stand only read 80 because that's as far as it would go. No one checked the, the, the readout on the telemetry to see that the, the power would drop off. The temperature, we know now, got up to 1,000 degrees Fahrenheit. Boiled off all the oxygen, no fire, no explosion, nothing, but damaged the heater system. No one ever caught it. Uh, everything was fine. Day or so before the launch, we filled up the tank full of oxygen. It was a bomb waiting to go off. Two days out, when Fred and I were in the lunar module with the TV camera, 
The ground caught up as one of the last things to do before we were going to shut down for the night. Turn on your heater system and, and the little fan because we want to stir the, the, the oxygen. We see the pressure dropping. Swigert through the switch. We surmise now that the Teflon that coated the wires caught on fire. The pressure built up inside the tank blew the neck of the tank off, which we never heard. The liquid oxygen rushed out into the bay where the tank was located, which was vented to a vacuum. The liquid flashed into a gas. The gas pressure blew the entire side of the spacecraft off. The catastrophic thing of this whole incident was the fact that that explosion, which we did hear, ruptured a line or a valve in our second and redundant oxygen tank, which was perfect anyway, and that was the oxygen I saw escaping from the rear end of my spacecraft. Wow. It, it's so phenomenal. I, I kept saying to myself, what are all the things to learn from this? And uh, so I made a little list. Engineers make lists. And the first thing I was thinking, your, your demonstration test went really well, went terrific right before. Everything and, was fine. Until you went to, to siphon everything out, that is what, in fact, created the, that siphoning process is what created the problem. It was just waiting to happen. If, in fact, uh, somehow the, uh, there was a, they used the low voltage for the heater, it wouldn't have, wouldn't have fried that switch or anything like that. So the first rule I th think I learned from this is that the test isn't over till the fat lady sings. You have to, <laughs> exactly. everybody had signed off on the test. Everybody had signed off. Everybody had signed off on the original drawings of the uh, tank. Uh, you know, all the contractors plus NASA. There also, there didn't seem to be any sensor tests, any way to tell that that little 28-volt switch thermostat, ther thermal sensor was now fried closed by the 60 volts. We didn't have a temperature gauge that showed the temperature going anything above 80 degrees. And so we never really understood what the temperature was. Yeah, and you couldn't tell that you couldn't open and close the sensor remotely. No, that's right. Yeah, I, th I think we all want to keep remembering that this is 25 years ago. In addition to which, the tank that you had that was so fried on the inside by boiling up to 1,000 degrees or more, boiling this, this oxygen off, um, today we would have taken high-energy ray, X-rays or N-rays, and we would have looked straight through that tank, and we would have seen that it didn't look right on the inside anymore. Possibly with technology today. We didn't have that 25 years ago. I still don't know how you guys got there. <laughs> Much less got back. Well, very fortunately, we had a lunar module. Yes, that's right. That's right. Now, finally, one of the things that I, I think was very poignant about it is that you, in fact, spoke with the, with the testers and the engineers. Um, and when they were talking to you, they were saying, well, you know, I think we just have to uh, you know, boil this off, and we'll use what the what this purpose is for. And you said, "Well, okay, we'll go ahead." People said, "Well, Jim, you approve this." I really think that's unfair. Well, we all approved it. I mean, I had no more knowledge than the engineers that you know that there was something wrong. No one, of course, knew about the uh, the thermostat. Uh, mm -hmm. No one at the Cape, you know, understood that there's a thermostat that wasn't the right one. And with all the spacecraft before it, no one had ever turned on a heater system. Uh, for that length of time that would even uh, get hot enough to let that thermostat open up. So the 28-volt thermostat uh, uh, flew in all the other flights and everything was perfect. I think finally, the, the last last point that, that has struck me, because I've, I've, I've said it myself and I've heard other engineers say it, is that in this particular case, we think, well, what do we, why does liquid oxygen need a a heater. Well, these were actually, this was slushies. These, <laughs> it was so cold, it was slush. And it could get too cold. It was down, was at minus 340 degrees. And so the heaters would get it up, would get it up. And what occurred to me is that that instrument that wouldn't read over 80 degrees, because, well, it couldn't possibly go over 80 degrees. How many times we've designed to, not possible, can't happen. And here it was. Actually, you're right. The only reason it got up so high was the fact as it boiled off the oxygen, which was very cold, and the volume of the oxygen went way down, then the heater started to rise in temperature because it was now in a, just a, in, a, in the air or the, the, you know, the, the, minus the oxygen, and that's where it really got damaged.
Now, you said over the air at one point on the mission, uh, this will be the last mission for a long time, and you got some flack for that. Oh, boy, did I get flack for that. You know, it was like uh, like the uh, military officer coming back, you know, from the war, and the and the PR guy tries to say what he really wants is uh, his mother's apple pie, you know, and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> I, I looked out uh, at the moon. I was on what was known as hot mic. Instead of pressing the button to talk, every time I talked, it would actuate actuate the microphone, and it went down 200,000 miles down into the control center. And I talked to Fred Hayes, and I said, look at the moon. It'll probably be the last time anyone is out here for a long time, or the last moon mission for a long time. Well, that that you know sentence drifted down, and uh, of course, the news media got hold of it right away, and they, they got hold of poor uh, Tom Payne, who was the administrator, and... Uh, and try to make a lot of it. And after the flight at the first press conference, uh, that was the first question that came around, and I had to uh, tread water, hem and haw. And I meant that. me, said Jim. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> That's right. You had another harrowing experience that really comes through in the book, and that is when you were flying banshees off the aircraft carrier Shangri-La. How do you compare your Apollo 13 experience? Tell us about that experience, and how do you compare your Apollo 13 experience with it? Well, of course, I was the Navy pilot before I got in the space program, and I was a night fighter pilot in those days when the squadrons didn't fly at night off of carriers. They just had teams. Uh, And I put it in the book only because it led up to the incident, and it reminded me uh, when I was on the Apollo flight back in those days when I was a a carrier pilot. I I had uh, trained off the coast of California, uh, to uh, to land at night uh, in about uh, I guess it was August of of uh, 55 or something like that and uh, and went out to sea in a ship called the Shangri-La we were off the coast of Japan when I had my first night launch in February so that was well over six months away and uh, I was a little rusty and we took off and uh, three of us took off there's supposed to be four planes and one of them was held on the deck because the weather was getting very bad and uh, so they told us just to rendezvous around the ship. They had canceled the exercise. And I got lost because uh, my uh, uh, antenna, or my ADF, it's Automatic Direction Fighter, got locked on to a, uh, a station in Japan or on, on the coast of Japan rather than the ships. And my two companions found the ship, but I didn't. And uh, I was actually heading for Japan trying to find out where I was at 1,500 feet, which you shouldn't do in a jet airplane. And uh, suddenly... I decided to turn around and try to look for something, and I had a knee pad that I had designed. I'm a amateur engineer. Thank goodness. Yeah, <laughs> and I had this knee pad which I designed with a light on it, which I was very proud of, because I, it's hard to see at night the little numbers, and I decided to to plug the knee pad, the light into the receptacle in the airplane. I threw the switch, and every light in the cockpit went zap. Dark. And all this blackness was starting to rain, and it was the clouds were coming down. All the darkness outside had just drifted inside. And when I took off my oxygen mask, I thrust a uh, pen light in my in my mouth to look at the instruments. And you know, pen lights have just a little round light, and it was dancing between instrument to instrument. And I was beginning to sweat quite a bit. And finally, you know, trying to figure out where I was, I called the ship. I said, "Do you have me on radar?" Or are you painting me? I should have said. And they said no. And uh, and finally, I turned off the light. And I was trying to think of what to do. When I looked down and saw uh, sort of an eerie phosphorescence on the water. And it was sort of greenish. That's the only thing I could see. I couldn't see a horizon or anything else. And uh, it dawned on me that that was the the churning of the algae because a screw of a ship turning will churn up the algae and, and form a luminous phosphorescence on the water. And I said, I wonder if that's the carrier, because it was a big ship, but there was a lot down there. So I turned around, and to make a long story short, I found my companions circling the ship, and then I I had to make a landing with no lights, which was another hairy incident. You bet uh, the luckiest guy I've ever met, Jim. <laughs> yeah, but I put it in the book only because it, it was not the first time I was in a little bit of trouble. <laughs> <laughs> I see. Yeah. You and Frank Foreman and Bill Anders were named Times Men of the Year 
for the Apollo 8 mission. And that was very thrilling, our first trip to the moon. But still, in my mind, the Apollo 13 mission was, was far more daring and a, and a far greater reflection of humor, human endeavor and calculated risks and bravery. Is it my imagination, or did you receive more plaudits for your, your first moon mission? We received a lot more plaudits for the first mission. Uh, if you kind of go into my study down at Horseshoe Bay, you'll, you'll find uh, oh, letters from presidents and vice presidents. You'll see the Harmon Trophy, the Collier Trophy, the Gold Space Medal. Uh, you'll see a lot of those awards and trophies from my first three missions, Gemini 7 and Gemini 12 and Apollo 8. The only real thing I've got from Apollo 13 that came from the outside was a letter from Charles Lindbergh, who wrote me and said, congratulations, we think you did a, a great job. 13 was, in all aspects, a failure. Uh, I think it as a successful failure because we got back home again. And uh, But uh, NASA and its human nature to forget and try to put aside failures and remember those successes, like Apollo 8, like Apollo 11, things like this. And so it wasn't until years later, like a fine wine that needs aging over a period of time, when people suddenly decided that, you know, 13 was a tremendous monument to the technology of people who faced with a crisis situation, not just in the air, but the ground controllers and the contractors working together as a team with initiative and motivation to bring a spacecraft, an almost certain catastrophe, back home safely. Well, Apollo 8 took place during the Christmas season, and on Christmas morning, you came around the back of the moon, communication again around the back. We couldn't hear you. You were gone for 40, 45 minutes. And when you, you came around the front there on, on Christmas morning, you all read from Genesis in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And it was such a, a stunning moment. How did that decision come about to read from Genesis? And would such a biblical reading be possible today? Uh, well, the way it came about was this. Uh, as we plan to do Apollo 8, which I think it was my most awe-inspiring flight. I, I remember that very, very vividly. Uh, it dawned on us in our trajectory that we would be orbiting and going into orbit about the moon on Christmas Eve. What a appropriate time to say something. First flight to the moon, uh, what can we do? And we thought, well, we could change the verses to the night before Christmas. We could have a new... <laughs> In a verse of uh, Jingle Bells or New Words, something like that. None of it seemed appropriate. There was a man who worked for the U.S. Information Agency who had uh, accompanied a lot of the crews on their trips around the world. And he heard of our plight, and he said, you know, you'll be around the moon at a very auspicious time, Christmas Eve. But, and over two billion people will be listening in, but most of those people are not Christian." Why don't you say something that's appropriate to the majority of the people? And that's how it came to pass on the last orbit around the moon with our little TV camera pointing down that we read the first 10 verses of Genesis from the Old Testament, which really is the basis of many of the world's religions. Do you think it'd be possible today? I think so. Uh, today, I think that that would be possible today. Uh, we were, by the way, sued by uh, a lady by the name of Madeline O'Hare in Dallas who said we were mixing government and religion, I guess, which is a, a no-no. So you got away with it anything. We got away with it anyway, <laughs> yes, we got away with it. Well, you were just mentioning you've flown four NASA missions, Gemini 7 with Frank Borman, uh, Gemini 12 with Buzz Aldrin, Apollo 8 with Borman again and Bill Anders, and of course Apollo 13 with Swigert and Fred Hayes. So so we just talked to Buzz, and we said, Buzz, you know, we're going to be talking to Jim. you got to give us something really good, something nobody else has. Come on, Buzz. Well, he couldn't come up with anything. <laughs> now, I was worried about you, Buzz. Don't worry about Buzz. When we interviewed him, the last time we interviewed Buzz, right at the beginning of the hour, I said to him, Now, Buzz, when was the last time? It's been 25 years since Apollo 11. When was the last time somebody asked you a really original new question? And he said, 24 years ago. 
And so then I said, well, if you think of a new one, just you know, jump in. You got a whole hour here, just jump in. So he didn't jump in. Later on, we're driving him to the airport. And he turns to me and he says, Moira, you know, about halfway through, I almost had a new question. <laughs> <laughs> so, he goes, but then we were talking about something else. It got away. So I have absolutely every confidence that Buzz is going to call me tomorrow morning. <laughs> so you're, you're safe say, for you now. You should have asked Jim this question. You should have asked Jim this question. You're right. Um, you wrote this book with Jeffrey Kluger, and uh, who has many serious journalistic credits to his name. But many of us know him by that column, uh, Light Elements and Discover. And I love that. It shows just how inane science can be. How did you two get together to write that this book? And and how did you inter- how, how did that interaction uh, uh, well, work? It's, uh, Maria, it's a it's a very interesting uh, uh, little story. I uh, got in the telephone industry after I left NASA and the uh, space program and spent actually another career there. And I actually retired from uh, Centel, which is a telephone company, in uh, January of 91. Because I was on their board, the directors very graciously let me have my uh, office and a secretary for a little while while I wound out into, quote, retirement. And uh, so we looked at each other and uh, I said, what should we do now? And she said, well, why don't you write that book about Apollo 13 you've been talking about all these years? <laughs> I said, good idea. Then I said, well, I wonder how I'm going to do that. I've got to do a lot of research, you know, a lot of stuff I've forgotten, everything like that. Just about that time, as fate would have it, I got a letter from this young writer for the Discover magazine. He said, I have never written a full-length book. I've written a lot of articles for Discover. I'm a science writer. I've written for other magazines and everything like that. But I thought Apollo 13 would make a very interesting story to write a full-length book. And I wrote back, and I said, I've been thinking the very same thing. I've been trying to get together and write this book for some time. Why don't we get together and co-author a book on Apollo 13? And he said, a great idea. Uh, I'd come up with a lot of the data, of course. I wasn't in the control center. So we had to research a lot of that, and Jeff did a lot of the research of the what happened in the control center all the, all that time. I knew quite a bit of what happened, of course, in the spacecraft. In fact, I went hunting turkey hunting one time, and in the blind, I, I spent the whole week writing the story, and more turkeys got away with eating the corn and getting out of there. Uh, and, uh, and I would send this raw text down to Jeff. He would put it in his style. The, the deal was that we would use his style of writing, mm-hmm. and that's what we did. And we went through the whole procedure, uh, writing the book that way, and it, 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 I think it came out quite nice. We we were it was a very good marriage. Now the book has been bought by Imagine Entertainment. It's it's being made into a movie. It's being directed by Ron Howard, and starring you is Tom Hanks. And I'm I was thinking about this. Opie is directing your movie. The, the current Oscar winner, the heartthrob, is playing you. I mean, could you ever believe this could happen to you? It came as a complete surprise. As a matter of fact, our agent called me up one time after we had got Hood Mifflin to, to do the book, and, and we were just starting writing the book. In fact, to get we had a proposal of only one chapter, an outline, which we so, sent to the publisher, and he accepted that for us to write the book. And then I got this call from the agent, and he said, Are you sitting down? And I said, uh-oh, the publisher wants to back out. He wants his advance back. He doesn't want to do the book. And I said, yes, I'm sitting down. He said, we just sold your proposal to the movies. I said, we haven't written the book yet. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to showbiz. <laughs> yeah. uh, Ron Howard uh, accepted it. He thought it was a great story. We started writing this, the book, and we were sending raw chapters to a couple screenwriters who were then putting the screenplay together as we were writing the book. Uh, of, of course, the first draft wasn't too good. And by the time we got the book massaged and re- rewritten a couple times and everything, then I think the screenplay is now in about its fifth or sixth revision now. Well, they're shooting that now, aren't they? Oh, yes. They're about, I'd say, either half to two-thirds finished with the shooting. Have you been involved with that production at all? Yes, part of the deal was that I would be a technical consultant. And the nice thing is... of. Now, we're new authors, so we don't have much clout, and in, 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 they could put this on Mars if they wanted to. Uh, but, uh, Is there a female astronaut? Yeah. 
No, but they're, uh, uh, it's kind of interesting, the cast. Uh, uh, I'm a technical consultant. That was part of the part of the deal. And, and Howard wants to make this thing as authentic as possible. Everything is down to 1970. And just think of the cast. Not only is Tom Hanks playing, but we've got Kevin Bacon playing Jack Swigert. He's a star in his own right. Ed Harris is playing Gene Kranz, the chief of the flight director. Uh, Gary Sinise, who played Lieutenant Dan in Forrest Gump, he's playing Ken Madeley. And Bill Paxton, who just played in, uh, in True Lies, <laughs> is playing Fred Hayes. And my wife is being played by Kathleen Quinlan. It's a, it's a great cast. And everybody's enthusiastic. Uh, Hanks is a, uh, is, is a space enthusiast. He always wanted to play an astronaut in a movie. And he had heard that Howard had this option to do the movie on uh, this book. And Riddy was interested in doing it. So you've been able to be on the set and watch all this? Yeah. What's been tough for that to, to simulate? I mean, I, I, it's, it's so hard for me to, they've got to do weightlessness. They've got this small, it must be very difficult to get all that close to accurate even. Well, that's right. And there are some new techniques they're going to have for, for weightlessness and zero gravity. I don't want to tell you what they are right now. Go see the movie. But no <laughs> wires, no wires, no teeter-totters, anything like that. You'll actually see them floating. You'll actually see spheres of liquid loose, the whole thing. Well, you know, it occurred to me that in all the mock-ups for all of that, and you, you jettisoned most of the equipment that was out there. What, did it bring back anything to see all that equipment rebuilt? Yes, it's really deja vu. Not so much the spacecraft equipment, which was done by a very talented man by the name of Max Airy in Kansas, but they also recreated... Uh, the control center that was in Houston on a sound stage in uh, California at Universal City, down to the tile on the on the ceiling, down to the very knobs on, on the 40 consoles. You can't tell whether you were in Houston or in California when you step on that in the control center. In fact, they had two technical consultants that were flight directors and flight controllers during my mission, and they walked on there. They couldn't believe their eyes. One fellow Someone asked him where he lived. He said, just right around the corner, and he was in California when he should have been in Houston. <laughs> uh, the clothes that are designed, they, they took pictures of my wife and made clothes exactly as they were in 1970. The hairdos are 1970. Uh, everything is as authentic as possible. Including the mink coat? Yes, all of that won't show. That's That was Apollo 8 there. They've got to cut down the movie compared to the book. you got to read the book. <laughs> oh, read the book before you see the movie, please. <laughs> <laughs> For any number of reasons. Yeah. <laughs> That's great. I have to ask you, when you were, you were mentioning earlier about being a naval aviator, and your first assignment was here at Moffett Field, and that was before Silicon Valley. Tell us about when it was and what the valley was like then. I came here, my first assignment, I applied for Quonset Point, Rhode Island, thinking that the Navy would, you know, and, and I, why, I don't know, because I came from Milwaukee, Wisconsin. But I, <laughs> I got assigned to Moffett Field, California, best thing that ever happened to me. Sunnyvale in those days and Mountain View were little towns with apricot orchards in between. The El Camino Real ran down, and I think there was Bayshore Freeway 101 still, but but it was all little towns. The Santa Clara was a little town. San Jose was down the road, you know. Uh, uh, and there was nothing in between except trees and apricot orchards and things like that. Very quaint and very nice. Great time to live here. I bought a house in Sunnyvale for $14,000. That was the house. Uh, I had... Uh, Oh, it was at least 10 years ago. Now I went back there. I think it was around $200,000 or something like that at the time. So the thing is really going up in value. Should have held on to that house. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. That's right. Uh, I'm going to talk just a little about other parts of your life. In 1967, uh, LBJ appointed you to head up the President's Council on Physical Fitness, and you did that for 11 years. That, that was fascinating. How did that appointment come about, and what did you do? Uh, that's also very interesting because before that, mostly people who were uh, consultants to the president were uh, some uh, connected with athletes of some uh, some sort. Uh, Bud Wilkinson was on the president's council. Uh, Kennedy appointed him as his consultant. When Bud Wilkinson left to run uh, for Congress, I believe uh, uh, Johnson, who was then president, appointed Stan Musial, uh, the baseball player, 
Stan was on for a while, and then finally he got called back to the St. Louis Cardinals, and for about three months there wasn't anybody, and suddenly they decided, well, why don't we appoint somebody who is not a professional athlete, but who should be able to keep in pretty good shape, because that's what the most of us are. We're not professional athletes. We're, you know, working day to day, and we have maybe desk jobs or something like that. So I got a call from the White House one day, just sort of out of the blue, when I come to see President uh, Johnson, and uh, I did, and he got me in the in a little ante room there, and he said, I want to make you the, uh, uh, my consultant on physical fitness and sports. And I looked around because I wasn't, you know, uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger or anything like that, and I <laughs> thought, my gosh. Uh, and I said, very well, because the fire had just occurred at that time, so there was a slowdown of the space operations. Apollo 1. Apollo 1 fire, that's right. Uh, Jack Valenti was his chief of staff at that time, and and the president was over here, and he said to, to, to Valenti, well, what are we going to pay this man? And Valenti said, well, he's already a government employee, Mr. President. We can't pay him anything. Uh, <laughs> and uh, so I took on the job for President Johnson, and when the President Nixon came in, I stayed and worked for Nixon. Then I worked for President Ford. And then I worked one year for uh, President Carter. And after 11 years, I thought it was time for some new blood. And I tendered my resignation. That's fascinating. Now, you were talking earlier about you were in tele- telephone, Fisk Telephone, Centel, and now you're, you're heading level communications. What else did you do? What is all that about? What did you do? Well, that's also interesting because when I retired from NASA and, and the Navy in 1973, well, before I did that, I went to Harvard Business School, the Advanced Management Program, and I learned just enough about business to be dangerous. But I thought uh, in looking at a Navy career, uh, and I was a captain for about seven years, that to go back in the Navy uh, and to get try to get promoted to admiral and I was, if I was on the selection committee and Lovell's name came up and somebody who had spent a lot of time uh, perhaps did, with tours in Vietnam and war college and everything, who would I pick? And I said, well, the Navy is there to defend the country. I'd pick the fellow that has all the experience and not the guy that's been spending all of his time just running around in space. So I decided to retire. And I, I uh, first of all, I got in the tugboat business for a while, which was kind of interesting. And then I decided to go into telecommunications, which was just coming on its own. Uh, I joined a little company that sold telephone systems, uh, which was just being allowed by an FCC decision to sell telephone systems. Uh, and the Bell operating, you know, the Bell company, of course, fought it all the way up to the Supreme Court, but the Supreme Court refused to rule, and that was the beginning of the breakup of the Bell system along with MCI's operations. Uh, our little company went from $8 million to $40 million in a couple of years, uh, so it was very lucrative. We married the computer to the telephone system, which was uh, a new innovation. And uh, our company was then sold to a larger company called Centel. I went with a larger company, and I stayed with them until I retired in 91. And then my secretary and I looked at each other when I said about the book and, and, and speaking, and we said we have to have a name for ourselves, so let's call ourselves Level Communications, and that's how that came about. You couldn't retire if you wanted to, Jim. No, I think retirement is just doing something else. <laughs> it's a career change. It's a career change, right. <laughs> well, I do have one last question, and I would say that if any American had a harrowing experience in space, you certainly did. After four space flights, the one being in many ways the most terrifying in, for all of us in history, I mean, so far away, so inconceivable what happened and coming back, you did retire. You've certainly made your contribution to space travel and exploration. Still, let's play what if. If they had a spare seat on the next shuttle, had your name on it, would you go? Oh, definitely. All right. Definitely, sure. <laughs> I, would love to, I would love to go, but I went back and, and looked at the people they have on board now, and I'd really hate to compete with them because they were just in high school when I was flying, they all challenged their, their education and their early career to become astronauts. And uh, all are very talented. Uh, and, of course, we now have men and women. And, of course, the women are a lot prettier than I am. So <laughs> it's obvious that, uh, that they have good talent now. But uh, if they would give me the chance, I'd go back. You'd go. I'll yeah. tell them. Okay. <laughs> Jim, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you, Maura.